The year was 1993. Theatres across the world were taken by a storm with the release of a never seen before type film. It was the first time that people were seeing gigantic dinosaurs roaming in a park. Based on a book by Michael Crichton, this film became one of the biggest money spinners of all time, raking in billions of dollars. The film was famous for its near-realistic recreation of dinosaurs achieved primarily through animatronics and computer-generated imagery. The film was praised for its visual effects, realistic CGI and mesmerizing background score. The film helped create an increased interest in the field of paleontology by changing the public perception of dinosaurs. There were many sequels to Jurassic Park which came out since then, but the awe of seeing them for the first time was probably never matched. The Jurassic Park dinosaurs created as theme park attractions by a company called Ingen were cloned through genetic engineering. The process was accomplished by extracting ancient DNA from mosquitoes which sucked the blood of dinosaurs and then became fossilized in amber, preserving the DNA. The Jurassic Park scientists used this DNA to create various species of dinosaurs. I'm sure all of you who would have watched this movie when it was first released or later would have had this question on your mind. Is it possible to recreate prehistoric extinct animals using the latest technology? Although everyone may agree that bringing dinosaurs back might not be a sensible thing, but could we bring back less vicious animals? Will humans ever be able to create the lost world? That is what we will discuss in today's video. Hi, I am Anand and I welcome you to Pale Blue Thoughts, the channel for promoting scientific temper. De-extinction, also known as resurrection biology or species revivalism, is the process of generating an organism that either resembles an extinct species or is an extinct species. We know of several animals and birds apart from dinosaurs that have become extinct. The sabre-toothed tiger, woolly mammoth, the flightless dodo, passenger pigeons are some common animals that we know once existed but now don't. In fact, around 99.9% .9 of all species which once existed on Earth have gone extinct. So we have a lot of animals that we can bring back. But is it easy to do that? What sort of technology would we use to achieve it? What are the hurdles that are likely to be before the resurrection biologists? Let us go through each technology and its merits and demerits. There are several ways to carry out the process of de-extinction. The first one we may all heard of, cloning. There is also selective breeding and the latest genome editing. Let us look at cloning first. Cloning refers to the process of creating an identical genetic copy of an organism or a specific part of an organism. This is something that already exists in nature. In nature, some organisms produce clones through asexual reproduction. This reproduction of organism by itself without a mate is known as parthenogenesis. Many species create their next generation using parthenogenesis. Some examples include aphids, whiptail lizards, stick insects and komodo dragons. Reproductive cloning aims to create a whole organism that is genetically identical to the original. The process involves taking the DNA from a donor cell and inserting it into an egg cell that has had its nucleus removed. The reconstructed egg is then stimulated to develop into an embryo which can be implanted into a surrogate mother for gestation until birth. The most famous example of reproductive cloning is the cloning of Dolly the sheep in 1996 through the efforts of a team of scientists led by Dr. Ian Wilmot at the Roslyn Institute in Edinburgh, Scotland. Dolly gained worldwide fame as the first mammal cloned using a technique called somatic cell nuclear transfer. Dolly lived for six and a half years before she succumbed to a lung disease. Dolly's birth and her subsequent health issues sparked debates and raised ethical concerns regarding the cloning of animals. Nonetheless, her birth represented a significant milestone in the field of cloning and opened up possibilities for further scientific research and advancements in de-extinction. Dolly was highly significant because the effort showed that genetic material from a specific adult cell designed to express only the characteristics within its genes can be redesigned 
to grow an entirely new organism. For example, a liver cell is supposed to do a certain function, a kidney cell yet another function. To take one of those cells and make it perform a completely different function and end up being a complete animal is a miracle that only science can do. So what is somatic cell nuclear transfer? First, scientists take a body cell or somatic cell from the donor animal that they want to clone. This cell can be taken from the skin, muscle or any other part of the body. Next, they take an egg cell from a female animal of the same species. This egg cell now has its own nucleus removed, leaving it empty. The empty egg cell and the somatic cell are brought together in a laboratory. The nucleus from the somatic cell which contains the genetic material of the donor animal is inserted into the empty egg cell. The egg cell with the new nucleus is then stimulated or treated in a specific way so that it starts dividing and developing like a normal embryo. Once the embryo has developed into a certain stage, it can be implanted into a surrogate mother, which is a female animal of the same species who will carry and give birth to the cloned offspring. The cloned offspring that is born will have the same genetic information as the donor animal from which the somatic cell was taken. This means they will be genetically identical or very similar to each other. Very simple in theory but difficult in implementation. It took 435 attempts before Jan Wilmot and his team could successfully create Dolly's embryo. So it is not an easy task to clone an animal. So if you thought that Dolly is the only sheep cloned so far, you would be wrong. Many other scientists have created various other animals through cloning. A rhesus monkey named Tetra was created using embryo splitting in 2000. This is more like how twins are produced naturally. In the same year, the Chinese managed to clone pigs and were producing around 500 pigs a year to test new medicines by 2014. Gaur or the Indian bison was the first endangered species cloned in 2001. Two cattle named Alpha and Beta were cloned in Brazil. A rat named Ralph was cloned in 2003. The first successfully cloned horse, Prometea, took 814 attempts to be created. Snuppy was the first dog to be cloned in 2005. The first cat that was cloned was aptly titled Copycat. In fact, almost all animals that you see around have been successfully cloned. The Pyrenean ibex, which became extinct in 2000, was the first extinct animal to be cloned, but she could only survive for a few minutes after she was born. So the Pyrenean ibex got the dubious distinction of becoming the first animal to become extinct twice. Next, let's look at another technology called selective breeding or back breeding. So what is selective breeding? It is a breeding strategy where animals with desired traits are mated together to reproduce offspring that exhibits those desired traits. Remember the Siller Fox experiment that I talked about previously? They used selective breeding to create very human friendly foxes. Now back breeding is a technique that aims to go back to a previous generation that possessed the desired characteristics in order to reinforce or enhance those traits. The first experiment that was attempted was to bring back an auroch, an extinct cattle species considered to be the wild ancestor of modern domestic cattle. It was one of the largest herbivores that lived some 12,000 years ago. The African oryx may have survived until at least to the Roman period as indicated by fossil records. It was still widespread in Europe during the time of the Roman Empire where it was widely popular as a battle beast in Roman amphitheaters. Excessive hunting began and continued until it was nearly extinct. Fossils found in West Bengal indicate that the Indian oryx may have survived until the early 12th century. The oryx have been depicted as paintings on cave walls. So back in the 1920s itself, two scientists named Haynes and Lutz Heck tried to breed an auroch look like using European cattle breeds by using back breeding techniques. The result, Heck cattle were strong but differ from the oryx in many respects, although a resemblance in color and less reliably horns had been achieved. In 1996, scientists attempted to back breed them again with other primitive breeds in order to enhance the resemblance to the oryx. The results are called taurus cattle being larger and longer legged than heck cattle and having more auric-like horns. 
but they are not clones although there is a resemblance other attempts of bag breeding includes the bag breeding of pigs to create iron age pigs and the quagga project of these the quagga project is an attempt based in south africa to breed animals which strongly resemble the now extinct quagga a species of the plain zebra which died out in 1883 the quaggas were ruthlessly hunted down by humans and by selective breeding from a selected population of the plain zebra an attempt is being made to retrieve at least the genes responsible for the quaggas characteristic striping pattern another famous project underway is the dire wolf project the dire wolf project is a breeding program aimed at recreating the physical and behavioral characteristics of the extinct dire wolf the dire wolf was a large prehistoric wolf species that lived thousands of years ago and went extinct around 10000 years ago the goal of the dire wolf project is not to bring back the exact same species but to create a modern breed of dog that resembles the dire wolf in appearance and temperament anyways bag breeding is not a very easy process and so it is not a common technique used to bring back extinct animals Today the latest techniques involve a combination of techniques such as cloning, genetic engineering and selective breeding rather than solely relying on back breeding. This brings us nicely to the latest technology that could yield positive results. Genome editing. Genome editing or gene editing is a scientific technique used to make changes or modifications to the DNA of an organism. DNA is a genetic material that carries the instructions for how an organism develops and functions. In simple terms Think of a DNA as a set of instructions that determine how an organism is built like a blueprint. Genome editing allows scientists to make changes to this blueprint, adding, removing or modifying specific parts of the DNA. The most commonly used technique for genome editing is called CRISPR-Cas9. I will attempt to explain what it is in brief. Scientists use a molecule called CRISPR which is like a pair of molecular scissors. It can be programmed to target and find specific sequences of DNA in an organism's genome. Cas9 is an enzyme that works together with CRISPR. Once CRISPR finds its target DNA sequence, Cas9 cuts the DNA at that specific location. When the DNA is cut, the organism's natural repair mechanisms come into play. The cell attempts to fix the cut by either joining the ends back together or introducing new pieces of DNA. During the repair process scientists can introduce specific changes or modifications to the DNA sequence. They can add, remove or alter genetic information at the targeted location. By using this technique scientists can potentially edit the DNA of various organisms including plants, animals and even humans. CRISPR-Cas9 is a powerful tool for gene editing and in theory it could be utilized to assist in de-extinction effort. However, it is important to understand that the application of CRISPR-Cas9 in the extinction is still largely speculative and faces significant scientific and technical challenges. The potential use of CRISPR-Cas9 in the extinction would involve obtaining genetic material from preserved specimens or closely related species and using CRISPR-Cas9 to make precise modifications to the DNA of living organisms such as closely related species or surrogate hosts. However, the feasibility and practicality of using CRISPR-Cas9 for de-extinction are complex. The first is the availability of intact genetic material. The first is the availability of intact genetic material. This has been the most challenging roadblock in the whole process of de-extinction. Obtaining high quality and intact DNA from extinct species can be extremely challenging as genetic material can degrade over time. This is best explained using the attempts that scientists have made to recreate the woolly mammoths. The woolly mammoth is a species of mammoths which is a close relative of the Asian elephant. The woolly mammoth was roughly the same size as modern African elephants. The woolly mammoth coexisted with early humans who used its bones and tusks for making art, tools and dwellings. They also hunted the species for food. It was found in certain parts of the world until about 3000 years ago. We have also unearthed many species found frozen in many parts of the world. Many of them have well preserved body parts including its fur, bones, tissues and tusks. The existence of preserved soft tissue and DNA of woolly mammoths have led to the idea that the species could be resurrected. 
We could use cloning to remove the DNA containing the nucleus of the egg cell of a female elephant and replace it with a nucleus of the woolly mammoth tissue. The cell could then be stimulated into dividing and inserted back into a female elephant. The resulting calf would have the genes of the woolly mammoth. But the problem that scientists face is that the most intact mammoths have little usable DNA because of the conditions of their preservation. There is not enough to guide the production of an embryo. A second method involves artificially inseminating an elephant egg cell with sperm cells from a frozen woolly mammoth carcass. The resulting offspring would be an elephant mammoth hybrid and after several generations of crossbreeding these hybrids an almost pure woolly mammoth could be produced. Several projects are working on gradually replacing the genes in elephant cells with mammoth genes. In 2015, using the new CRISPR-Cas9 DNA editing technique, one team led by George Church had some woolly mammoth genes edited into the genome of an Asian elephant. In fact, just like in Jurassic Park, a scientist named Sergey Zimmer is in the process of creating an ecosystem that existed during the last glacial period. The natural reserve called Pleistocene Park has been created in northeastern Siberia and a suggestion has been made to introduce the mammoths if any method is ever successful to the Pleistocene Park. So in effect, although none of the extinct animals have been recreated as yet, we have already built a park to house them. Finally, we come to the challenges that all these techniques face. Obtaining high quality and intact genetic material from extinct species can be extremely difficult. DNA degradation over time presents a significant challenge, especially for species that have been extinct for a long time. Even with preserved genetic material, there may be gaps in our knowledge of the extinct species genome. Understanding the complete genetic makeup and intricacies of an extinct species is crucial for accurate recreation. We don't want to repeat the mistakes that the Jurassic Park scientists made, do we? Also, the absence of living organisms closely related to the extinct species which can serve as surrogate hosts for the reconstructed genetic material can hinder the extinction efforts. The reintroduction of an extinct species into its former habitat can have significant ecological consequences. The ecosystem may have changed since the species went extinct and reintroducing a species without considering these changes can disrupt existing ecological relationships. There could be disease-carrying organisms which didn't exist when the animal was previously alive and this could prove dangerous to the newly created animal. Then there is the question of ethics. There are concerns about the unintended consequences of cloning and other de-extinction techniques like genome editing. There is always a potential for misuse or exploitation and the impact on biodiversity. Public perception and acceptance of de-extinction is really important when it comes to recreating extinct animals. In conclusion, de-extinction is a captivating concept that holds the promise of bringing back species that have long vanished from our planet. While the idea of resurrecting extinct animals is fascinating, it is crucial to approach de-extinction with caution and careful consideration. The scientific and technological advancements required to make de-extinction a reality are still in their early stages, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. As we explore the possibilities of de-extinction, we must remember that our primary focus should be on conserving and protecting the existing biodiversity that inhibits our planet. Investing resources in preserving the currently endangered species and their habitats is crucial for maintaining the delicate balance of our ecosystem. De-extinction reminds us of the importance of preserving the biodiversity we have today. It is a reminder to appreciate and protect the incredible diversity of life on the pale blue dot, the only home we all have. I hope you liked today's episode and the information provided was new and useful. Please like, share, comment and subscribe if you like the content. I shall be back with more scientific content. Until then, it's bye-bye from Pale Blue Thoughts.